Parvo is a word that strikes fear in the hearts of both puppy owners and veterinarians alike, and rightfully so. This devastating virus can and will kill your beloved puppy in less than a day without proper treatment and is unfortunately one of the most common diseases that we see at the clinic that young unvaccinated puppies succumb to. So in this video, I will explain exactly what canine parvovirus is, what the clinical signs, causes, diagnosis and treatment options are, as well as what you can do to prevent your pup from contracting this virus and how you can try and get rid of it if you already had it on your property. Hey guys, Dr. Peacher. I'm a veterinarian from South Africa. Now, canine parvovirus is a highly infectious virus that commonly causes severe illness and death in young unvaccinated puppies, usually between the ages of six weeks and six months. The reason why this virus is so deadly is due to the way in which it mutated to infect and injure the pup's body. The parvovirus loves to attack the fast dividing cells in the body and therefore the symptoms of the disease is determined by the types of systems that are under attack by the virus. The cells most commonly targeted are the cell lining on the inside of the intestines, the cells inside the lymphatic system and the bone marrow cells. Now the intestines serve many different functions, but one of the main functions is to absorb fluid and nutrients from the ingester that passes through the digestive tract. The inside lining of the intestines consists of a villi, which are kind of like little tiny finger-like structures that is in direct contact with the ingester. The main reason for the finger-like shape is to increase the surface area in order to increase the contact time with the passing ingester in order to make sure that the body can reabsorb and retain as much water and nutrients from the ingester as possible. Now, when this virus attacks these villi, they will start to break down, thereby reducing the surface area drastically and this ultimately results in the diarrhea that we see as not enough fluid can be retained by what is left inside the intestines. This destruction of the villi also causes bleeding into the intestinal lumen, hence the bloody diarrhea we often see, and this exposes open sores and ulcers within the intestinal wall to all sorts of bacteria inside the gut, which can lead to a severe septicemia as these bacteria will have freely access to the bloodstream. Needless to say, this whole process is very painful, so you will notice the dog hunching over when palpated on its abdomen. It will stop eating completely. There will be a rapid deterioration of the dog's general habitus, leading to lethargy and weakness. And it may start to feel so bad that it will also start to vomit. Initially, the vomit may contain remnants of the dog's last meal, but as vomiting continues, all that will come up will be foamy mucus that may contain bile, which is a yellow-brown digestive fluid, or sometimes even blood. Dogs who become dehydrated will also drink a lot of water, only to vomit it up as well. And this is only one part of the problem. Seeing that the virus also attacks the lymphatic tissue, which include the lymph nodes and the thymus, as well as the red and white blood cell precursors in the bone marrow, this makes recovering from this dreadful disease much more difficult as these cells all play a vital role in fighting infections in the body. And to top all of this, a small patient such as a puppy has a very large body surface to weight ratio. This means that even a little bit of fluid loss can be detrimental as it can easily lead to dehydration. So now you will have a small puppy that is vomiting and having bloody diarrhea, who is not able to eat, causing him to dehydrate very quickly, and whose body is severely compromised to fight off a potentially severe infection. This is a recipe for disaster. And without proper treatment, these pups have a 90% chance of dying within a day or two, as the combination of diarrhea and vomiting may lead to hypovolemic shock and the infection from the gut can get so severe and completely out of hand that it leads to septic toxins being released into the bloodstream, 
resulting in widespread septicemia, multiple organ failure, and ultimately death. In some small puppies, parvovirus can also infect the heart, which will cause inflammation of the heart muscle, poor heart function, and arrhythmias. But this is not so common to see. Now, parvovirus spreads through body fluids, including in a dog's poo and vomit. It is extremely contagious, and dogs mainly contract it when they come into contact with the contaminated feces of infected dogs. The virus is also very resistant and can live for up to several years in the environment, such as on surfaces in kennels, bedding, food, water bowls, carpets, grass, on people's hands, or on the clothing of people that have been contaminated with particles of the virus. The incubation period, which is the period from when the dog was first exposed to the virus and contracts it to the time that it will start showing symptoms, is usually between three to seven days. Parvovirus is species specific, which means that humans cannot get parvovirus from dogs. However, it is still important to use the utmost caution by wearing personal protective equipment if you come into contact with an infected dog and to disinfect your hands and clothes with a proper disinfectant such as F10 after handling them as you could actually act as a fomite and spread the virus to another dog via your hands or the clothes that you are wearing. Now puppies signalment, history and clinical signs will generally give us a strong suspicion of parvovirus and luckily there is a very simple test that can confirm the diagnosis. This is called the canine parvovirus antigen snap test or parvo ELISA test and basically involve taking a fecal sample by means of a swab in the rectum, mixing it with a reagent and then adding a few drops to a test kit. It works very similar to a human pregnancy test, so if two stripes become visible, it will mean that it is positive and that the dog has parvo. We will also generally perform a fecal flotation test to rule out any worms or intestinal parasites as these can greatly aggravate the disease and will prolong the recovery period if they don't get eliminated. Parvo can also get diagnosed by means of a fecal PCR test and some vets prefer to run blood tests as well in order to measure the amount of white blood cells in order to get a baseline number to work from. Now, the big challenge with treating this virus is that there are no systemic antiviral remedies available which are effective enough to actively kill the virus itself. The killing of the virus must therefore be done by the dog's own immune defense system by means of antibodies which are gradually produced in reaction to the virus attacking the body. The only problem here is that these take a few days to develop, so in essence the main aim of treatment for parvovirus is to support the dog symptomatically, to try and keep him alive for long enough, with the hope that he will develop a strong enough immunity to fight off the virus himself. And the way in which this is achieved is by, number one, placing them in isolation or quarantine in a special secluded unit in the hospital to prevent the spread of the virus to other animals. Number two, putting them on a drip and administering intravenous fluid therapy with electrolyte supplementation to help prevent dehydration and electrolyte imbalances. If the puppy loses a lot of protein, then plasma transfusions will also often be given to help prevent life-threatening edema. Number three, administering intravenous antibiotics to fight off the infection, such as amoxicillin and metronidazole. Number four, administering anti-nausea medication injections such as meropitin or metoclopramide to try and prevent further vomiting. Number five, administering antacids such as cimetidine or other types of gastroprotectant medications such as sacrophate to help heal the intestines and to prevent further ulceration of the GI tract. Number six, providing them with proper nutrition that will allow the intestines to heal. Now, dogs recovering from parvo infections should be fed a bland, easily digestible diet, and both heels and royal canine make great prescription veterinary diets that are carefully formulated to be nutritionally balanced and gentle on the GI tract. If the dog cannot eat by himself after about three days, then a nasogastric feeding tube may need to be placed, 
We will also measure his blood glucose regularly and if this drops too low, we will often supplement glucose in the drips as well. Number seven is tender loving care or TLC, which includes keeping them clean, warm and dry and monitoring their vital signs very closely. And finally, number eight, your vet may also consider a fecal transplantation where he will take a stool sample from a healthy dog and then transplant it into the colon of the infected dog. This has been proven in the past to work quite well to help reduce the diarrhea and associated fluid losses, which can actually mean the difference between life and death for the patient. Now, once treatment has been started, it can take up to 10 days to establish whether the animal will survive, but usually we can see which direction we are moving between three to seven days. And needless to say, the treatment for parvovirus is very intensive and therefore also very expensive. It can range anywhere from a few hundred dollars to a few thousand, depending on the severity of the illness, the length of the hospital stay and the location of the vet clinic. Now, once a dog is eating by himself and keeping everything in, he will be discharged from the hospital and sent home on a course of medication that needs to be completed for the next couple of days. Your vet will advise you on exactly what type of diet your dog will need, but in general, a home cooked diet such as boiled chicken meat and white rice without any spices, skin or bones should be fine for the first couple of days at home. Now, I'm pretty sure you can tell by now that this virus is deadly and that without the best possible treatment, the poor pup will have a very poor chance of survival. So I'm going to be very clear with this one. There is no home remedies for parvo. I know the internet is littered with people stating that they have cured their parvo puppies with stuff you can get from the pharmacy or grocery store, but be very careful to trust these sources. If you postpone taking your dog to the vet for even just 12 hours by first trying some random dude on the internet's homebrewed concoction, it might mean the death of your beloved pup. Now, I do understand that not everyone has the financial means to afford intensive hospitalized care. In these specific cases, your vet may recommend treatment on an outpatient basis where the dog will need to receive daily subcutaneous injections such as antibiotics and anti-nausea meds, subcutaneous fluids and anti-nausea syrup, anti-diarrheals and electrolytes that needs to be mixed with water and administered into the dog's mouth with a syringe at home. This method will help to bring the cost down of treatment and some dogs do survive this way, but the chances of survival will heavily depend on your ability as a pet owner to keep them clean, warm and dry at home and by administering the fluid and medication as prescribed. Now the good news is that parvo can be prevented with appropriate vaccinations and vets will therefore recommend that all puppies start on a core vaccination program from around about six weeks of age, after which they will need to receive at least two booster vaccines, three to four weeks apart, and then an annual booster vaccine thereafter. Puppies should only socialize with fully vaccinated dogs until they are also fully vaccinated as well. The only exception is puppy classes at a reputable training center, as all puppies are required to have at least their first vaccine against parvovirus, and training and socialization at an early stage are extremely important. Now, as mentioned earlier, parvovirus can sit in the environment for a very long time. The virus has a really strong capsule around it, which protects it from heat, cold, humidity and drying, and which thus makes it incredibly difficult to destroy. The virus is therefore also quite resistant to many cleaning agents, but some strong household cleaners like bleach or even swimming pool chlorine is effective enough to destroy it. But it is important to understand that sanitizing an area that has been exposed to parvo is a two-step process that involves both cleaning and disinfecting, as many disinfectants do not work well on things like stool or urine. So firstly, you need to clean up any organic material from the yard 
and in the house. And if the bedding or toys are not too heavily swelled, they need to be washed and dried on a hot setting. Bathe any dogs who were exposed or infected and recovered, as well as other dogs who had contact with the infected dog or area using regular dog shampoo. This will help to decrease the risk of fomite transmission from the fur. Once you are done with this, you can start with the disinfectant process. You can mix either one part bleach, also known as 5% sodium hydrochloride, or one part hydrogen peroxide with approximately 30 parts water to use as a proper disinfectant for floors, bedding, food, water bowls, or any other surfaces that might have been infected. Just make sure that the diluted bleach have at least 10 minutes of contact time with the surface before rinsing it off. For the outside lawn, bleach will not work too great as it may actually damage the grass and flowers. So for these areas, it is best to use water to spray down the area to help remove any dried poop or vomit and thus to try and dilute the concentration of the virus over time. This dilution combined with the sanitizing effects of sunlight can bring the numbers of viruses down to an acceptable level in a couple of weeks. In most home yard situations where there is grass and dirt, it is not possible to completely disinfect the yard. Out of an abundance of caution, you may want to avoid having unvaccinated dogs come to your yard for 6 to 12 months, even after cleaning and attempting to disinfect. Now, because dogs that recovered from parvo can still actively shed the virus for another 40 days, it is important to isolate them from other dogs in the yard, especially from those who are unvaccinated or only partially vaccinated. Also, if you are getting a new puppy from a breeder or rescue center, do not take them home without making sure they had at least the first vaccination against parvo. Always ask for proof by means of a vaccination card that was signed off by a qualified vet or vet nurse that they have been vaccinated and confirmation of when the next vaccine is due. Fighting canine parvovirus is a bitter life and death battle. The combination of dehydration, suppressed immunity and overwhelming infection makes this virus probably one of the most difficult diseases to treat for us as veterinarians. We have some nasty parvo strains in South Africa and for me personally, I probably have around a 60% success rate with the virus and this is even when I tried everything I possibly could to pull them through by means of intensive hospitalization. The survival rate drops even further if the dog is not given veterinary attention quickly after showing clinical signs or if the dog is not hospitalized with sufficient supportive care. This virus is a death sentence, but it can easily be prevented by means of a proper vaccination protocol. So please, if you do get a new puppy, make sure he or she is vaccinated. It will save you a lot of money and many unnecessary tears in the long run. If your puppy did get sick with parvo and managed to make a full recovery, then he will typically have lifelong immunity and should lead a normal life once the recovery period is completed. Thanks for watching guys. If you found this video to be helpful, I would really appreciate it if you can leave a like on this video and share it with your friends and your family. And if you are new to my channel, then welcome and consider subscribing as I'll be posting new videos on interesting pet related topics every week. And as always guys, have a lucky day and I'll see you in another video next week. Cheers.